Well, it has been a wonderful series we're in on the art of neighboring so far. I have really enjoyed, especially this last week, many of you who have sent me uh, stories of your neighboring adventures. That's been great. Um, it's, it's also not uncommon, uh, not just during this series, but it's not uncommon to hear from different ones of you at different times who text or email or sometimes even tell me in person that the Lord spoke to you during a message. Now, the, the ones of you that I have trouble with are the ones that say, you were looking right at me during that message. Let me just clarify. Uh, I, I can see certain people in the room. It's a little harder to see those in the back. I'm not looking at you when I preach, okay? If you sense that, that's the Holy Spirit, and you better, you better pay attention. <laughs> now, if you've ever come to me and told me that a sermon really spoke to you, you likely heard me say, hey, I just preached myself and let you guys listen in. Now, that's not a sense of false humility. That's obviously what I mean. I'm a, I'm a pilgrim on the journey just like you are, but I want to take just a minute this morning and share something regarding the messages you hear from this pulpit. If you sense the Lord is speaking to you, he may be encouraging you, he may be calling you to a deeper obedience, he may be calling you to correction. If you sense the Lord is speaking to you, it's not my words. My words do not have power. It's only his word that has the power to change. I I don't have the ability to preach change into your life. My words aren't life-giving. It's the work of the Spirit. That's why every Sunday before I step into this place, I kneel right there and and remind myself, I don't need to remind the Lord, but remind myself it's not my words. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not my church. You're not my people. You are my people, but you're his church and his people. And so I take very seriously when I step up to this place and I try to be careful to handle God's word correctly and only preach what the word of God says. But I am human, I am infallible, as you saw so vividly displayed on the screen a few moments ago. (laughs) The best I can do is preach the Bible as I understand it from my time at studying. So you and I both need to pray every week as we arrive at this place that the Holy Spirit clarifies the truth for us. I need you to pray that as you, as you come each Sunday. Well, three weeks ago, we started this journey, this series on neighboring. We were asking the question, what exactly does it mean to, to neighbor? Uh, you may remember we started the first week, and I s- shared the story with you, that group of churches in Arvada, Colorado, that met trying to figure out how to improve their neighborhoods. They met with city leaders, and city leaders suggested to the churches the best way for the church to minister to the city was by becoming good neighbors. You know, as a culture, we become very dependent when we see needs or problems or issues in the culture. We become very dependent on the government. We, we figure the government will take care of it and solve those problems and create programs to take care of those problems. But it's not the government's responsibility. And even if the government had enough money to create programs to cover all these needs, to make sure there are no impoverished kids or single moms, at-risk kids, isolated senior adults... Programs don't best meet the needs of people. Relationships with other people best meet the needs of people. And Jesus spoke very plainly uh, about the impact his followers were to have on their community. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16 is probably a text that most of you are very familiar with. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, said these words, You're the salt of the earth, talking to us who are his followers. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a lamp, light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. He said, we're the salt of the earth. What what does salt do? Salt flavors and salt preserves. We are supposed to flavor our neighborhoods, our community with the gospel. As we flavor our community and neighborhoods with the gospel, we preserve whatever godliness is in our culture. And I realize there's not much godliness left in our culture, but we want to preserve whatever is still there. Now, we can't do that. We can't be salt. We can't flavor. We can't preserve without getting out and mixing it up with people. 
we have got to get out of the shaker, out of the salt shaker. God is going to have to shake some of us to get us out, but we've got to get out of the shaker. That salt shaker sitting on your dining room table does absolutely nothing to flavor your food until you do what? You pick it up and you shake the salt out. Jesus said we're to be light. If we're going to be light, we can't hide in a comfortable place. We can't sequester ourselves. If we're going to be light, we can't play it safe. We have to get out into the darkness. You know, too many of us are like the little boy that I heard about whose mom, after dinner one evening, instructed him to go out on the back porch and get the broom and sweep the kitchen. He went to the back door and he opened it and he looked out and he said, Mom, I'm not going out there. It's dark out there. She said, Son, you don't need to worry about the darkness. Jesus is out there. So I went back over and cracked the door open and said, hey, Jesus, if you're out there, can you hand me the broom? <laughs> That's how we act, right? Hey, Jesus, can you take care of that? No, he calls us to go out into the darkness to be salt, to be light. And neighboring enables us to be salt and light and to influence our communities. We've got to be shaken out and we have to get out from under the comfort and the safety of cover and become salt and light. Last week, uh, or two weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan where Jesus uh, reaffirmed the great commandment to love God and love neighbor. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan and, and the uh, teacher who came to him and Jesus explaining that you're a good neighbor when you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself. And when we fulfill the great commandment, we then fulfill the great commission. We have been commissioned as the body of Christ to go into all the world to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to baptize them, to teach them the things of God. That happens very naturally as we are fulfilling the great commandment to love our neighbor because it provides opportunity. Last week we talked about the, the, uh, the time and priority problem a lot of us have. You remember we looked at the story of Mary and Martha and talked about the importance of choosing uh, what is most important, what's priority in life. And if we're going to do what God has called us to, then we all have to sit down and, and prioritize. We're going to have to eliminate some time stealers in our life. We're going to have to structure our schedules where we have some margin. We can be uh, interrupted and we have some flexibility in our life. Now, to be honest, what we've talked about so far has, has set the bar pretty low. But there's still significant impact because little things make a difference. So far, we've said that, that we need to learn a name and we need to move from stranger to acquaintance. We need to learn more um, about our neighbors and what's important to them. By the way, um, I said last week I was going to introduce myself to two new neighbors. I did not see either of those neighbors this week. But I went over last night, was that last night, with Luann uh, to another neighbor's house that we did not know well who had a very uh, tragic loss in their family back in January. We got to spend some time uh, with the wife and uh, talk to her and minister to her and I assured her I would come back by and give her my number so that she could call for whatever they might need and we're going to continue to invest in that neighbor. Well, the next step, moving from uh, acquaintance to relationship gets a little bit harder. Moving from acquaintance to relationship where you just speak to someone or wave to them or say, hey, how's the weather, gets a little bit tougher because you have to invest more of yourself um, with that neighbor. You've got to find ways to get to know them. That may be a cookout in your backyard. That may be going together with others in your neighborhood, uh, putting together a block party, some other things like that. You may be sitting here this morning thinking, well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what to do. I think... Uh, before you leave this campus this morning, you'll have some ideas about what you ought to do. Will all of your neighbors be responsive to your outreach to them? Absolutely not. But some will. And some will provide the opportunity for you to get to know them, be a part of their life. What is neighboring? By the way, if you haven't been here before this week, if you're a guest this morning, you might say, well, what does neighboring have to do with living the Christian life? Why is a pastor taking time talking to his congregation about neighboring? Well, neighboring has to do with following Jesus. Doing what he did, living like him, being like him. You know, the, the end goal of your maturity in, in, in the faith is that your life is totally built around Jesus and you look more and more like him. Well, this is exactly what he would have done. Last week, when we talked about Mary spending time at the feet of Jesus, you know, when you take time and you spend time with Jesus, his heart becomes your heart. You spend enough time with Jesus and you get what, what the burdens are on his heart, on your heart, and pretty soon you start seeing what he sees. 
and you feel what he feels and you do what he would do if he were here but you know what he is here through you you're called to be Jesus to your neighbors turn with me to the gospel of Luke this morning we're going to look at several uh, snapshots from Jesus life and his interactions with people we're going to start in Luke 19 and really, we're just looking, I'm not going to make a lot of commentary on this passage, these passages, we're looking at two simple things. What kind of people did Jesus spend time with, and what did the religious leaders think? What did they feel about Jesus' choices? Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. As he was seeking to see who Jesus was, he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. That's the religious people. They all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now turn back just a few pages to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. This is not Zacchaeus. This is a different man that Luke is writing about. Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. After this, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi. By the way, you know, the tax collectors were probably the most hated people uh, among the Jewish people because they were seen as betrayers, as traitors. They worked for the Roman government, not only collecting taxes to the Roman government, which were very oppressive to the Jewish people, but also making an exorbitant income by overcharging on taxes. So they, were, they were hated people. He saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. After leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at a table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know what verse 31 and 32 tells us? Jesus always was willing to come to environments that the religious leaders thought were inappropriate. He didn't hang around just religious people. He didn't hang around people who were favorable toward him. He went to places where there were people who were the outcasts of society. He spent time with people um, that, that we today, I guess, would call sketchy. Why? Because that's the people who needed him. I was thinking this week back to the first home uh, that Luann and I bought. We had lived in an apartment for a few months after we were married. We, we bought our first home, and it was a nice little neighborhood, just a couple of streets, knew most of the neighbors. And there was, there was a couple across the street from us, John and Lisa, still remember their names to this day. And uh, John and Lisa one summer had a pool put in. We thought, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to go swimming at, at John and Lisa's pool. Well, not long after the pool was put in, um, it was Lisa's 40th birthday, and, and John was having a big birthday party for his wife. Huge cookout, lots of beer. And I was out working in the front yard, and, and you could see right into their garage and right through to the big pool in the backyard. And it seemed like the entire neighborhood was at this party for Lisa's birthday. We weren't invited. Now, I didn't get upset with that. You know what I started thinking? I wonder if we gave off a we're uncomfortable kind of vibe. And that's the reason that we weren't invited to that party. Have I ever turned down an invitation to an event because I thought... There would be things happening there. I would be uncomfortable in that vir environment. Yes. Was I right in doing that? Probably not. You see, I could be there without doing what they do. I could still be present. I could still hang out with my neighbors. I don't have to do whatever they're doing that, that I don't consider appropriate. 
I heard one pastor say, if you want to reach the unchurched in your neighborhood, you have to be willing to have a little bit of beer spilt on your deck. Now, hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying have a big keg party. I'm saying if your neighbor shows up, you're grilling, you invite your neighbor over, and he shows up or she shows up with a beer or drink in their hand, you don't sweat it. You have to love them where they are. You know, I thought about how many times as a student pastor, I told teenagers, look, you need to be careful with the company you keep. Yes, you need to have friendships with lost students, teenagers, if you're going to reach them. But, boy, you need to be careful that you don't spend too much time with them. I, I would often quote 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Bad company corrupts good morals. And is that good advice? Yes, they need to be cautious. The problem is too many of us carried that same advice in, into adulthood and were unwilling to be around those people. You know who I'm talking about, right? Those people? If you're not willing to be around those people, let me ask you a thought-provoking question this morning. If you're trying to be like Jesus, when is the last time that you hung around with people who would make religious people uncomfortable? That's what he did. If we're trying to be like Jesus, are we willing to hang around people that if our church friends saw us, they might think, what is he doing there? What is she doing there? I'm not encouraging you to put yourself anywhere that might cause you to stumble, but you have to get out there and mix it up with irreligious people if you're going to be a good neighbor. You know what we want to do? We want to have parties. No, I'm sorry. That's the wrong word. We want to have fellowships at church to invite them to because we're very comfortable at church. But guess what? They're not. We can't just have parties at church. We can't just say, hey, come over here and join us. We have to go where they are even if it makes us uncomfortable. Look at another party that Jesus went to, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Down starting in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at a table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering him said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Now, here's what's happening. This Pharisee, he didn't invite Jesus to his house because he was interested in what Jesus had to say. This Pharisee was a, was a skeptic. He was just intrigued. He wanted to hear more, maybe have more with which later to entrap Jesus. So he invites Jesus to dinner. Well, what does that mean? Well, this Pharisee was pretty upstanding in society. He probably had uh, some means financially. So he probably had a big home. And in the, the middle of this home would have been a big open courtyard. And he would invite not only Jesus, but other uh, society people, other religious leaders in. And they would have been, and that day they didn't sit at a table. They reclined around a low table. But they would have been in this courtyard setting, reclined around a low table. And the courtyard would have had doors that opened literally to the street, where people passing by could see what was taking place. And in fact, 
if you were passing by and you were interested in what was happening in there, you could come in. You wouldn't partake of the meal, but you could come in and, and stand around the walls uh, of that courtyard, that banquet space, and, and you could listen in to the conversation. And so what happened was they're sitting there at this banquet in the courtyard, and it says this woman came in, and notice you, it says this woman who was a sinner. That's code word. That's polite speak. She was a prostitute. That's what it means. This prostitute comes in. Evidently, she has heard Jesus teaching somewhere else because it says that she came to this banquet because she heard that he was there. So she heard him somewhere else and was probably overwhelmed by the level of love that he told her and other sinners that God had for them, for her. And so she came and she brought this alabaster flask of perfume and usually perfume sealed in an alabaster, alabaster flask was because it was very, very expensive. This was probably the most valuable thing this person had, and, and she breaks it open. You see that it says that she washed his feet with her tears. That shows great respect. She kissed his feet. Utter debasement. Humility. You know, he mentions to Simon, Simon, you didn't even wash my feet when I got here. That was a very common practice in their day because as you walked the dusty streets wearing sandals, your feet got pretty dirty. And when you got to someone's house as a guest, they would have a servant wash your feet. Simon didn't even do that for Jesus, didn't respect him that much. He said, look, this woman has washed my feet. She kissed his feet. Imagine he's been walking through the city all day. This is in the evening. His feet are filthy, and she's kissing his unwashed feet. Why? Because of her incredible love and gratitude for him and his love for her. Look at verse 39. Simon said to himself, if he were a prophet, he would know. Simon's thinking, you know, if he were really a prophet like he said he is, he wouldn't let this woman with this reputation touch him in public. He wouldn't be anywhere near this woman. You see what happens next? <laughs> this is hilarious. Jesus responds to Simon's thoughts. He didn't say that out loud. He's thinking that, and Jesus responds to his thoughts. That is hilarious to me. But it's also very sobering. Jesus knows what I think about everyone that I encounter. He knows what I think about my neighbors. He knows what I think about those people. I don't have to speak it aloud. He knows. So he tells Simon this little story. There are these two people who owe a debtor. One owes uh, 50 denarii. A denarii was a day's wage. Taking the average wage around here, one owed uh, $12,500. The other owed $125,000. And he says the debtor forgave both. Which one will love the, 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 excuse me, not the debtor, the one who is owed the debt, forgave both, which debtor will love that man more for forgiving their debt? And Simon says, well, I suppose, he knows he's been trapped. I suppose it's the one who had the greater debt. And then look at verse 44. Simon, do you see this woman? Well, of course he saw her. The room is not that big. It's not like in here with all these people the room was not that big. There were not that many people. Of course he saw her, but that's not what Jesus was asking, was it? He was asking, Simon, do you see this woman? Can you look past her past? Simon, can you look past her kind? Can you really see this woman? Do we really see people? Do we really see our neighbor? Do we see what's happening in their life and maybe the reason they act the way they do or, or treat us the way they do is because of what's going on in their life? Like, like Simon, we fail to really see people and seeing what's going on with the people right before us. We have blinders on. We're caught up in our own world. Or we have filters on. We, we label people and because of that we close the door to them. We forget about how much they mean to Jesus. Do you see this woman? There's an old saying, good fences make 
Say it out loud. Good fences make. That's a lie. Good fences make a good, safe, clean environment, but good fences also put us in isolation from our neighbors. Fear keeps us from encouraging people, and and frankly, I think a lot of that has to do with the media exposure of constantly overplaying accounts of human depravity so much that we become scared and we, we withdraw, we make assumptions and we believe the worst about people based on their, their uh, race or their ethnicity or their religion. We're suspicious and fearful of people we don't even know. There are people in our neighborhoods that we don't even know and we're suspicious of them. You know, I would say yes to discernment, yes to safety, but don't let fear keep you from engaging people who are different. You know, the major fear in neighboring is not really that. It's something we talked about last week. The major fear in neighboring is that they're there all the time. It's pretty easy to go neighbor when you're just out and about and you run into someone who has need that you don't know. It's pretty easy to neighbor if you're uh, out, of, out of the state or out of the country on a mission trip. It's pretty easy to neighbor people like that. It's hard to neighbor people that you live around that are there all the time. We, we talked last week about the fact it can really be a quagmire, man. You can get bogged down in trying to neighbor and really minister to people who are always there. They're always there. They always see us. We have to be living it out all the time it's tough I think the Lord really intended for us not to miss out on his call to love our neighbor because not only did he tell us that quoting from the Old Testament he spoke that in the New Testament but he also put it on Paul's heart to bring it up again in Galatians chapter 5 Paul in Galatians 5 14 under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God said this the whole law is summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting when you think about it, if you really follow that one command to love your neighbor as yourself, everything else kind of falls in place. If you truly love your neighbor, you're truly trying to love your neighbor, you're going to have to spend more time with God. God's going to have to speak to you and inspire you and help you be creative. And and God is the one that you're going to have to talk to about your neighbor and the issues you're facing. If you really love your neighbor, you're going to look more like Jesus. You're going to become more compassionate like he was. And if you love your neighbor, as I said earlier, you're going to be fulfilling the great commission that God has given you and me to get the gospel to everyone. Loving your neighbor is the one command that makes everything else fall in place. And listen... Being a good neighbor doesn't just change your neighborhood. It's going to change you. Neighboring is going to, going to change and shape you. It's going to confront how you spend your time, even how you spend your money, how you view your things, how you view your purpose in life. All of that is impacted when you decide to be a good neighbor. It's easy to learn names, but moving from acquaintance to relationship is much more difficult and much messier, but Jesus calls us to the messiness of relationships. And I I can pretty well promise you this, when you really begin to neighbor as we're called to neighbor and you begin to see God work through your neighboring, you won't want to go back. You're not going to get there with every neighbor, maybe just one or two. But God has placed people around you and me that are empty and that are hurting and that are hungry and that are open. What if there was just one? What if everyone in our body said, you know, we're going to take the great commandment seriously. We're going to go out and do things that make a big impact. But what if, what if for each of us, just one might respond? What might happen? Every day, we have to make choices about how we spend our time, how we spend our finances, how we spend our, our energy emotionally, what we're going to give ourselves to. God has called us to be a good neighbor. That, that's the main thing we're called to focus on, love God and love our neighbor. First John 3.18, John wrote these words because we're always tempted to say we love others, but maybe not live it out. John in 1 John 3.18 said, don't love with word and talk, 
but in deed and truth. Don't talk about just loving people. Don't talk about treating people like Christ. Just talking about it means nothing. It does nothing. Do we truly love people? If we truly love people, then our deeds will attest to our love. You know, I thought about this week, especially now that people are, are outside more. What if, what if every time I, I pass by a neighbor, every time I saw a neighbor out, what if, what if in, in my mind I said, you know, I'm, I'm busy, I'm, I'm tired, I don't feel like engaging? What if when I had that thought, I made myself say, I don't really love Jim. I don't care about him. I'm not really concerned about Susan's eternity. What if I made myself say that out loud every time I wanted to just pass on by? We can't live and act like we don't know. If we belong to Christ, we know the spiritual condition of those who are without Christ and we know their destination for those who are without Christ, we, we can't say, well, we didn't know, we didn't realize. There's some great wisdom in Proverbs. In the 24th chapter in verses 11 and 12, it says this, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does he not keep watch over your soul? Does he not know it? Will he not repay man according to his work? We're going to be held accountable for our neighbors. We're called to rescue those who are being led to the slaughter. Think of that spiritually. Think about eternity. We, we can't say, well, God, I didn't know, I didn't know my neighbors. I didn't, I didn't know. No, he knows our thoughts. We can't claim to be ignorant. He's clearly told us that we're to love him and to love our neighbor. That's our calling.